welcome everyone to the Conscious Woman podcast. I am beyond excited to welcome my guest for today, Dr. Shri Kumar Rao, who I consider to be a mentor because it would be no exaggeration for me to say that his ideas have transformed my life, the way I think, the way I work, the way I think about ideas like success and, and happiness. And I'm so excited that we get to have this conversation today because Dr. Rao has shared so many of these ideas that I have found to be so moving and transformational in his latest book, Modern Wisdom, Ancient Roots. And I would love to discuss these ideas with him today. So welcome, Dr. Rao. I am so delighted to be speaking to you today. Thank you, Bhavna. And I might add that I am delighted to be on your show again. I thoroughly enjoyed the last time we met, and I have absolutely no doubt that this is going to be another really, really exciting and fun uh, visit. Thank you. Thank you. So before we even started recording, as we were catching up, I mentioned to you, Dr. Rao, how you in all your wisdom and and grace had given me a really useful piece of advice exactly a year ago when i had asked you how i can make a bigger impact in the world and what you had shared was Pavna, what you need to do is simply get out of your own way because if you do the work will start happening more and more through you and it won't happen from you or by you. And to be honest, it has taken me a very long time to fully understand that, fully comprehend that and work from that space. But I would love to begin by asking you what you meant by that, because I imagine there are a lot of people who would be watching this or listening to this who equally want to be success successful, want to make their mark uh, in the world. And um, I think this advice would apply to everyone. Oh, absolutely. It would apply to everyone, Pavna. Uh, okay. Think about how most of us live our lives. Most of us live our lives the following way. I set a goal for myself. I tried very hard. I succeeded. Life's a blast. Or I set a goal for myself. I worked very hard. I failed. Life sucks. We live our life oscillating on a sinusoidal curve between elation and despair, and we spend more time at the despair end of the spectrum. It's a lousy way to live. Now, a moment's reflection will reveal to you that whether or not you achieve your goal is not under your control. You think it is under your control. You know, if I want to reach my goal, all I have to do is uh, come up with a good plan and execute well on that good plan. And if I do that, I'll reach my goal. Not so. How many times have you done exactly what needed to be done, but some X factor, something you could not even have dreamed of suddenly threw all of your plans into a cocked hat? You know, I'm a, I, I'm a tennis nut, so is my wife. Uh, we haven't been to Wimbledon. So in 2020, I bought tickets to Wimbledon. They were very expensive because they were the final round tickets. And at that time, if somebody had said, Sri Kumar, you won't be able to say Wimbledon, I'd have said, yeah, perhaps possible. But in my head would have been something like perhaps somebody close to me fell ill so I couldn't go or something like that. I would never have imagined that the tournament itself would be canceled and there would be no planes flying between New York and London. Unexpected stuff happens all the time, Bhavna. So when you think I did it, you're actually kidding yourself. So if you don't have control, but you let your well-being tied up to something that you don't control, you're frequently down, depressed. Uh, you know, why would you choose to live a life like that? There is an alternative, and the alternative is set a goal for yourself. But once you have set a goal, you have established the direction. And once the direction has been established, forget about the goal. Put all of the actions, put all of your emotional energy into the activities that you have to undertake to meet the goal. If you succeed, fantastic. If you don't succeed, fantastic. And the reason for that, Bhavna, is the benefit of setting a goal and trying our level best to reach the goal 
is not reaching the goal. It is the learning and growth that happen in us and to us as we try our level best to reach the goal. If we actually reach the goal, that's a bonus. Be grateful. If you don't reach the goal, the learning and growth have happened. So it's a it absolutely cannot lose proposition. And when you approach life that way, two things happen. Number one, you begin to enjoy the journey. The destination, the outcome is a mirage. You get there, you tarry a few minutes, and you're off somewhere else. The journey is with you always. The journey is the only thing you have. So when you work like this, you begin to enjoy the journey. And paradoxically, when you are not particularly concerned about whether or not you reach a particular outcome, the likelihood that the outcome will be reached increases and increases quite a bit. So in your case, instead of going out desperately and trying to make things happen, oh, I've got to get the best guests. I've got to get the best guests to say the most profound things. I've got to make sure everybody hears it. Let it happen. Don't try to make it happen. Allow it to happen. And when you allow it to happen, you will be surprised at how well things go. Think of Roger Federer, if you've ever seen him play, how effortlessly, you know, he seems to hit the ball. You know, he's not doing anything. The ball is there and he's there. The racket is exactly where it needs to be, poised to deliver that crushing backhand or down the line a stroke. Visualize that as a metaphor. Allow things to happen. Don't make things happen. Don't try to make things. Of course, you have an intent. Of course, you have preferences. Of course, you work hard. But the effort of striving drops away. And that's when you find every day is a blast and things happen. Yeah, and, and the anxiety and that feeling of stress and overwhelm also starts to diminish. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> once once you occupy that space and i've i've definitely felt that shift what i find to be so powerful about your work is your ideas are unconventional in the sense that if you if you read the work of other leading thinkers and thought leaders in the personal development space and you and you listen to what they have to say about success the, the conventional wisdom is you work hard and you 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 know you aim high and and what what sometimes what you appear to be saying feels like it's the opposite but when when you realize the truth of it it just it just makes makes so much sense absolutely it does because I draw from the great masters they understood the human predicament. They came up with solutions that have been tested over millennia, and they absolutely work. Mm -hmm. All I've done is I've taken their teachings and adapted them so they're acceptable to intelligent people in a post-industrial society. So I'm a translator. I like to think I'm a good translator, but the wisdom is all theirs. One of the foundational principles of your work, Dr. Rao, is this idea of mental models. Mm -hmm. That this, uh, you, you, I've heard you speak so many times of this idea of we're all, in a sense, living in a matrix. We have yes. our own construction of reality. And that reality that we see, that we perceive, that we experience is, a, is in a large part a function of the mental models or these invisible rules that are governing our thinking and, and our perceptions. So my, my question to you would be, could you first of all give us an example of a mental model? Um, and how do we, how do we become aware of them? Because that, that's, that's really the big challenge. A, becoming aware of what are these mental models that, are, that I'm using, and, and then doing the work of changing them. Uh, let me preface that, uh, Bhavna, by elaborating on what you just mentioned. We don't live in a real world. We live in a construct. We think we're living in a real world, but we're not. Every one of us is living in the matrix. Only it's not a matrix created by an alien civilization out to enslave us. It's created by our own mental chatter and mental models. I'll give you an example. I'd gone with a friend 
when I was in college to a uh, to the Cape Cod. It was the first time I'd come to America, and you know he had a job in uh, Hyannisport and said, "Hey, Sri Kumar, why don't you come on?" And went there, and I discovered all kinds of things that I never knew existed. You know, there's this thing called mini golf, and it seems such fun to play mini golf and the Ferris wheels and uh, you know or Carnival Fair attractions. And I was completely enthralled with all of that. But my friend, who had a similar background, he was also new to the States, and thanks to him, I was, you know, in Cape Cod, in Hyannisport, enjoying all of that. He walked around with a very glum face. He had broken up with his girlfriend. And here it was, and it was a absolutely gorgeous summer's day, and the ocean was blue, and, you know, we had one of those paddle boats, and we could go out. Uh, on the ocean. And I was all thrilled and he was looking at that and he was all glum. He was thinking about his girlfriend, how bad it was completely morose and down. Beautiful, beautiful day, but all he was doing was thinking about his girlfriend. We do that all the time, Pavna. We live in our minds. We do not live in the real world. Now, I had a model, it's a gorgeous, sunny day, you know, I'm healthy, we're going out in a paddle boat, feeling the ocean, the winds on my face, how wonderful. And he had a model for life is terrible, I don't know if she'll see me again, I really love her, what can I do? We're living in different worlds at the same time, right next to each other. We are always living in our minds, we are not living in the real world. And the first most important thing you can do is recognize that this is happening. There is this incessant stream of thought you have in your head that's mental chatter. Mm -hmm. And these mental chat this mental chatter both comes from your mental models and it reinforces and creates uh, your old mental models and creates new mental models. They kind of work on each other, with each other, and together they become an unstoppable force. And your entire life is governed by that. You know, you're here, we're having a beautiful conversation and uh, then something happens and you say, oh, oh, oh my God, there's been a terrible accident outside, it's down and you thought, goes off down there and then you follow up with what impact is this going to have upon uh, you know the policing around here and uh, uh, is it going to affect my driveway uh, oh, you know, all kinds of thoughts pop into your head and this happens all the time so the first rule if you're going to bring your life somewhat under control is to recognize that you have this stream going on in your head and it's possible because as I talk about it, you can recognize, yes, I have mental chatter going on. Now understand that mental chatter is like clouds in the sky. You go out and look up at the sky and there are clouds and uh, you take a short walk and look up again and those clouds are gone, but there are new clouds. Mental chatter is just like the clouds, they are there. The problem is not that we have mental chatter, the problem is that we identify with our mental chatter. And when you identify with your mental chatter, they grab you by the throat and take you to all kinds of places, many of which you do not want to go in. So if you want to gain some degree of control over that, recognize that you are not your mental chatter and spend hours, days witnessing your mental chatter as opposed to being your mental chatter. That's the first step. It's the most important step. It's very easy to begin. It's enormously difficult to keep at it because you start observing your mental chatter and in seconds something happens and you're no longer a witness, but you become your mental chatter. So you have to practice. That's why that's the foundation exercise, if you recall, of yeah. my course, Creativity and Personal Mastery. And Bhavna, this is the rest of your life exercise. It's not, you know, I'm going to do it for a week and then I'm on top of it. This mm -hmm. is the rest of your life exercise. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so coming back to your book, Modern Wisdom, Ancient Roots, and the subtitle is a Movers and Shakers Guide for Unstoppable Success. So I'd love to pull out some common 
what at least what I have observed are what what some common mental models as they relate to success. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can can perhaps reframe or change them. So just today, in fact, I was having a conversation with a group of women and I was uh, essentially ask, talking to them about what they feel is getting in their way of doing what they really want to do. And most of them essentially cited the common fears that we all have. So I'm afraid of what the outcome might be. I'm afraid what if I fail? I'm afraid of judgment. I'm afraid of what people might think. I'm afraid of rejection. How do we build a healthier relationship with these fears? Or is there is there something else that we should be doing so that they do that they don't get in our way? Yes, there is. And this is part of the CPM course, and you experience that it comes towards the end. It's a comment made by Einstein. Now, we revere Einstein because he was a great scientist, and he was. He discovered the, or formulated the theory of relativity, discovered the photoelectric effect. That's why he got the Nobel Prize, by the way, for discovering the photoelectric effect, not for the theory of relativity. But Einstein was also a philosopher who had a pretty deep understanding of the way the universe works. And the question he posed was, or the statement he made was, the most important question you will ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Let me repeat that. The most important question you will ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Now, the vast majority of us believe the universe is neither friendly nor unfriendly. It's indifferent. It doesn't know I exist and couldn't care less. And here I am going around doing my thing. There's the universe going around doing its thing. Sometimes it seems to work for me. Sometimes it seems to work against me. But essentially, it's a random process. What if the universe was aware of your existence? And what if the universe was well disposed towards you? Well, friends don't shaft friends, right? So if the universe was well disposed towards you, why does it give you stuff you don't want? You want to go off on vacations and cruises and the universe gives you pandemics and lockdowns. Well, what if the universe doesn't give you what you want, but it gives you exactly what you need for your learning and growth? You're a small child, you want a tub of ice cream, but your parents give you fruits and vegetables and you don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream, but the universe through your parents gives you fruits and vegetables. And it isn't until you have a much higher level of maturity and wisdom that you can say, thank God I got fruits and vegetables. What if the universe was exactly like that? It gives you what you don't necessarily want, but exactly what you need. If you think about this, it becomes immediately obvious that regardless of whether or not the universe is benevolent, if you believe that it was your friend, your experience of life would become immeasurably better. And what if the universe actually was your friend? Then magic happens in your life. So with regard to your members who talk about fear, who talk about anxiety, if they can really get into get it into their heads that the universe is their friend, it's working with them, then all of those fears drop away. They, they're not existing. The universe is your friend. What do I have to be scared about? Now, here is the thing. Just because the universe is friendly is a mental model. Now, just because you recognize that a mental model is superior to the one that you're using doesn't necessarily mean you can adopt it. You actually have to work at uh, making the universe your friend. So how do you do that? Actually, it's very simple, Pavna. What you have to do is get yourself a notebook, call it your miracles notebook or your universe's friendly notebook, and look for signs that the universe is your friend. And there are so many of these once you start looking for it. Like, for example, you know, when uh, my book came out and uh, it's already been an Amazon bestseller in various categories, it's doing quite well in America. It's going to be on all the airports starting January 1. 
that's because the persons who do these things said January 1 is everybody is when everybody decides New Year resolution. I'm going to change my life around and your book is perfect for that. So let's put it on the you know, uh, shelves in January 1. I'm okay with that. So all of that is happening organically. And then I thought, gee, I'd like to have my book in India. And then uh, a, a client, a coaching client of mine introduced me to someone. And then you just introduced me to someone else. And, you know, things are happening organically. Now, I can put it down as it's a coincidence. Or, of course, you know so many people and they know people. So, obviously, this is going to happen, which is a dismissal. But if you look at it and say, miracle, I wanted something and it happened, then it is a miracle. When you start looking for signs like that, you'll see so many dozens of signs that the universe is friendly. Record all of them, note them down. When you note it down and start thinking about it, you reach a personal tipping point. And in that personal tipping point, you begin to wonder if there are so many signs that the universe is friendly. Is it possible that I was wrong and the universe really is friendly? That's the time for you to redouble your effort and very soon you'll tip over into the world where the universe is friendly. And every time it gives you things that you don't want, you stumble on a staircase, fall down and break your leg. Oh, okay, now I'm supposed to learn some lesson from it. What's the lesson I have to learn and how quickly I can? Your attitude towards these things changes. Mm. That's when you find that you have tipped over into a friendly universe and your experience of life is transformed. So if you're saying, what will they think of me? I am afraid. Will this work or will this not work? Hey, it's a friendly universe. Go off. You can't lose. Yeah. So would it be fair to say that the fundamental shift we are making there is from hope to faith? Instead of hoping things will work out, hoping I will get what I want, having the faith that I, I live in a benevolent universe, the universe has my back, and I will, if good things happen, great. If it doesn't, um, if it's not what I, what I initially imagined, that's okay. I take the learnings from that, and, uh, and I use it for my growth and move on. It actually goes deeper than that, Pavna, because faith is, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm going to believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. Because my parents said so, because my religious teachers mm -hmm. said so, because the holy books say so. And that's a wonderful start. But I'm not talking about faith. I'm talking about knowledge, about mm -hmm. belief. This is mm -hmm. so. Not that I believe this is so, but this is so. So that belief, that knowledge jumps faith. Mm. Faith so is when you place your reliance on something or somebody else. You know, the Gita says so, the Bible says so, therefore it must be true. That's faith. But this is, comes from a deep inner knowledge which is deeper than faith. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is begin the process as I've outlined, get yourself a journal, note down the ways in which the universe is friendly, and eventually it's no longer faith, it's knowledge. Yes. That yes. trumps faith. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. It's it's almost a con it's a conviction born out of knowledge. It's um, no longer yes. this is and sometimes you, as you go on this journey, you get it. You have the unerring feeling. I know this is going to happen. And yes, it does. All right. You have shared so many, uh, so many incredible ideas in your book, uh, some of which I think are definitely affirm what, what people may already be, may want to believe. Others, I have to say, uh, you know, lo very lovingly, like I think as someone had once said, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you really mad or, or, some, <laughs> so, or something along those lines. Because you read what you're sharing and the, the initial reaction is one of, 
if not anger of resistance of like, do I just, do I really want to believe this? Is this true? Just to give you an example, one of the one of the chapters that I that I love is where you where you say, um, and again, this goes against conventional thinking because most most people in the personal development would say, you know, you are special. You are, in fact, you should believe you're ex extraordinary. So you 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 build this confidence in yourself, and yet here you are in this chapter. You say you are not special and not only are you not special you should feel grateful that you are not special so tell us more about what you mean by that oh think about how much time and energy we devote to being special you know our parents hug us and say oh you're the most beautiful baby in the world how nice and you don't really quite understand that but it comes with love and affection and you like that love and affection and you cuddle up and then you go to school and there are other babies whose parents think they are the most special in the world. So a twinge of jealousy comes in and you, you have to be more special. You have to excel in one way or the other. And our school systems, they're well-meaning perhaps, but everybody gets a star so you can go home and show it to your parents and uh, everybody gets some kind of an award for something so nobody gets it. So there's all this industry really sent to make you feel special. And then you try hard to maintain that specialness. You have to excel and do things so that your parents think highly of you and say, ah, Baba, look at my Betty, how, how she has done. And that takes up an enormous amount of your emotional energy and your physical energy in terms of effort. And all it does is build up your ego. No matter where you go, there is someone who is better than you. Or if there is not someone who's better than you, you're going to age and your talents are going to drop and that person will overtake you. Roger Federer for years was at the top of his field and then slowly, you know, Djokovic and Nadal chipped away and now Nadal has more grand singles grand slams than anyone and Djokovic is close behind and both of them are ahead of Federer. And all of them are in their 30s and you have this young guy, Alcaraz, who's coming up and who knows, he might overtake all of them. There is always someone who is better. There is always someone who will accomplish more. And that is wonderful. Don't get hung up on that because if you really want to have peace, calm, serenity in your life, it'll come when you recognize that none of these matter. The only thing that matters is your relationship with who you really are and who you really are is pure spirit. You're not a body, mind, intellect complex called Bhavna who's living in Singapore, who has a son whom she dotes on, whose husband works for Google. That is a soap opera. That's a story you're telling yourself. You're embedded in that story. So by all means, enjoy it, but recognize that your nature is I am your awareness. This is a soap opera. Enjoy it. Now, in your quest to be special, I am special, I want this, what it's simply doing is it's getting you embedded more and more deeply into your soap opera. And the purpose of life is to get out of that embedding, to realize that you're free. So what we're doing is precisely the wrong thing. You're special in the same way that a grain of sand on a beach is special. It's there. One day is going to get washed off to the sea, whatever. It's a, be happy, be grateful. You're part of this glorious universe. So don't try to be apart from others and inculcate and build on your, quote, specialness. Just recognize, hey, you've got some talent and you'll use them. And other people have other talents. Some are great magicians. Some do great card tricks. Some are better singers. Some play the guitar. Celebrate and enjoy all of them. They're neither better nor worse. They just are. Yes. Just like you. You just are. And when you do that, you will find an immense freedom because you're no longer putting on airs. You're no longer striving to be special. You just are. 
as Ramakrishna said, the job of a flower is to bloom. When the flower blooms, the bee will find it. The rose doesn't get proud because, you know, I'm a beautiful rose. I'm more beautiful than this rose next to me, which bloomed earlier, so it's now shedding. Nor does it compare itself to the bud and say, oh, tomorrow this rose is going to bloom and it'll be better than I am. How sad. No, the rose blooms. It's yeah. effortless. That's what life should be like. Just concentrate on blooming. Stop trying to be special. You share so many of such w wisdom bombs, uh, if you will, in, in, your, in your book. I'd love to know of the 60 that you've shared in this book in particular, which ones did you initially struggle with the most and it took you a while to come around and fully appreciate the truth of? All of them, Bhavna. All of those are so counterintuitive. You know, I grew up like most uh, uh, of your listeners. I got to go off. I got, got to accomplish. I've got to do this. And I was fortunate. I was a good student. So I went to the very best institutions in India and then the world. I went to Stephen's College, Delhi University. I did my MBA at I, the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, all premier institutions. Then I did my PhD at Columbia Business School, one of the great business schools in the world. I taught at many top schools at Columbia, at London Business School, at Berkeley, at Kellogg, at Imperial College. Oh, yeah, see, you know, I've got to be good because, you know, all of these great institutions have hired me to teach at those and to have these bright students for that. All of that was basically ego-driven. And uh, it was great when it was there. But ultimately, anything which is ego-driven is accompanied by fear and lack fear that it will go away and lack because there's always someone who's better there's a more famous professor who has bigger clients who is more well known cited more widely it, it's climbing up a greased pole you go up trying desperately and then you slip down just as easily so letting go of all of that is something that i knew intellectually but it wasn't a part of my life. It was effort. Yeah, I got to let this go. But how the hell do I let it go when I have this fierce driving ambition? But the way it happens is the more you think about it, the more comfortable you are. And one day you're not thinking about it. It's become a part of you. That's how inner work always happens. You get an idea. It, it Look at this this way. Let's assume you're eating corn on the cob and you really like it. But then a fiber sticks between your teeth. And you don't have any floss to get it out, so it's stick, stuck between your teeth. What does your tongue do? It keeps going there constantly, nagging at it, and yes. one day the fiber comes off, right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly like that. These ideas that I'm sharing are like bits of uh, gristle that get in between your teeth, and with your tongue, you keep exploring, keep exploring, and it finally comes free. So as you keep thinking about all of these, the ideas start making sense. And one day they stop making intellectual sense, but start making visceral sense. That's when you know that you have turned a chapter and you are on a different stage of life and experiencing it. Yes. Yes. Keep thinking about it again and again. Shankara is a great Indian philosophy. A philosopher put it beautifully. He said it in Sanskrit, manasi vichintaya varam varam. Keep thinking about this over and over and over again. So when we, when we look at what most people want, I think we're all very similar in that in this one short precious life that we have, we're looking for a little bit of happiness, a little bit of success. Um, you, of course, share so many, so many insights on how one can live better. But if someone was to think about a good place to begin, what would be, what would, what among your many, many learnings would you, would you offer to someone who is beginning this path and just needs a good place to begin? Well, what I say begin with a very simple exercise. And that exercise is designed to help you have a terrific day every day. Would you like that? Do you think your listeners would like that? 
Yes. So actually, it's very simple to have a terrific day every day. And all you have to do is get up in the morning and decide that you are going to have a terrific day. Now, most of us make a huge mistake, and this mistake prevents us from having a terrific day. And the mistake we make is we think that in order for us to have a terrific day, two things must happen. Number one, stuff should happen that I want to have happen. And number two, stuff should not happen that I don't want to have happen. Neither of those is within your control. So recognize that up front. So if you're smart, what you're going to do is say, I'm going to have a terrific day. And in my terrific day, feces is inevitably going to fall from the sky. <laughs> so right up front, I'm going to budget two hours. And in those two hours, I'm going to clean up the feces that's going to fall from the sky and I'm going to have a terrific time doing it. This is going to be part of my terrific day. And then you'll have a terrific day every day. Mm -hmm. Understand, let's, let's assume you have an important meeting at work and you know, you're getting ready to go, but your son throws a tantrum. No, I'm not going to school. I'm not going to have breakfast. And, you know, you try hard and finally eats a little bit and you give him lunch and, you know, pack him off in the school bus and say, thank God, I'm late for my meeting. And you get in and as you get into your car and go off, somebody sideswipes you and leaves a long scratch on your brand new car and breaks your rear view mirror outside and then he disappears. So you don't even get his license and you curse and you get to work and obviously now you're very late and your important client has canceled the meeting and you can't reschedule it because his secretary says he's thinking it over. Oh, it, it's become a terrible day, right? Only if you let it. So if you look at the scratch in a car, if you look at your son's tantrum and say, am I going to let you steal my terrific day from me? And you say, no, I'm not going to let you steal my terrific day from me. And all of a sudden, you continue having a terrific day. But in that terrific day, you now have to make an appointment with the car's body shop to get that fixed. Maybe you'll get a loaner. Or you'll have to make other arrangements. Uh, you'll call up the teacher and say, hey, how's my son doing? You know, he had a rough morning. Is he OK? You know, it wasn't something you planned, but it's part of cleaning up the faces that's fallen from the sky. But you'll continue having a terrific day if you decide you're going to have a terrific day and you're not going to let all of this steal your terrific day from you. So all of these events, treat them as they were a person and ask them, will I let you steal my terrific day from me? And if you do that, you'll be surprised at how many things you can decide. No, I'm not going to let you steal my terrific day from me. I'm just going to do what I need to do. It's really that simple. It's not easy, but if you try it conscientiously day after day, you'll be surprised at how much progress you make in a relatively short time, within a month, and you'll start having more great days than you ever did. So to sum it up, we can all be radiantly alive, as you say, yes. if, we, if we can learn to observe our mental models, change them, have the conviction that we are living in a benevolent universe, just focus on being instead of striving, and, um, and just allow, allow things to come our way, believing that everything that comes our way will eventually serve, will be a, a tool for our learning and Absolutely. growth. Everything that come, happens in your life is a tool for your learning and growth. All right. Final question for you, Dr. Rao. Um, we call this the Conscious Woman podcast because one of one of the core principles or core messages uh, we want to spread through this podcast is that we can all choose to show up more consciously with the values we choose to live and work with. So I'm, I'm curious to know what are those values for you that you consciously practice every day? That's a very good question, Pavna. I guess the closest thing is there are persons who are great sages 
and the earth has benefited just by the fact that they were there. A contemporary sage is Ramana Maharshi. There are others like Nisargadatta Maharaj, who's even more contemporary, and Ramakrishna, who's slightly behind. But these are all people who knew the truths that I have enunciated to you, and they all expressed it in their own inimitable fashion. And what I'm doing is I'm spending more and more of my time going through their works, and I've gone through them before, and I know, quote unquote, uh, what all they said. But they operate at many different levels. And what is once a cognitive exercise is now becoming a visceral grounding. And I can feel that process is not only happening, but it's accelerating. And whatever it is that I can do to help, I will. I'm not striving and making it happen. I'm just giving opportunities for it to grow. And increasingly, I'm called to do that. So I'm doing it. Many of the things that I'm discussed with you are things that I previously would not have mentioned. And I would not have mentioned because there was judgment in my head. Oh, you know, they won't understand that or they'll think I'm a weird religious nut or something like that. And now I just share it because, hey, you know, this is it. That if you find it valuable, by all means, examine, adopt it. If you don't find it valuable, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Move on. And now I'm really not thinking about the impact. You know, I'm like Johnny Appleseed. I'm scattering the seeds. Some will land on fertile ground, become, you know, trees and eventually forests. And some will land on rock and wither away. And I don't know which is which. So I'll just be Johnny Appleseed and scatter the seeds. And whichever one's supposed to germinate, fertilize and grow will. And that's fine. I just want to thank you, Dr. Rao, for uh, for everything that you do and for the ideas that you put out in the world. As I said before, uh, they've been incredibly transformational for me. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude to you. And I know through your books, your programs, your courses, it uh, you're going to continue to touch and transform so many more lives. So. I wish you well on that journey and thank you so much for spending Thank you, Pavna, and I wish you well too. Thank A you. A big virtual hug to you. <laughs> thank you.